All right, so we had uh, three points of inquiry on the table. Uh, what's up with black nationalism? Why is so much emphasis placed on it? The distinction between hearing the speech and reading the speech, and then any new revelations or understandings of Malcolm now that you've engaged his work or his materials. Uh, who wants to start the conversation off? Um, for the first question, mm -hmm. uh, I want I just so what I believe from what I I uh, from my perspective, mm -hmm. I feel like like Islam, uh, like uh, how can I say this? Like the nation of Islam has like a lot to do with the black nationalism that like Malcolm X like emphasizes. Mm -hmm. That's what I gotta say though. Why, why, why for you, Damien, um, is the nation of Islam center central for Malcolm's understanding of black nationalism? Because you're, you're bringing up a good point, but what makes you think that would, would pop that for you? It's because um, it stood out to me because he's not, because uh, people didn't really, like, I didn't really see anyone else putting Islam on like that, how he did. He, he, uh, he was like the first person I like, that like really put it out there. Like he yeah. believed in what he like what he really did. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Damien. Um, does anyone else um, anyone else want to speak on what's mentioned in their breakout rooms, either regarding the distinctions between hearing the speech and reading the speech, or even even just a new understanding of Malcolm that you had prior to reading his or, or watching the speech? Sean, what was discussed in your group? Sean Montez, what was discussed in your breakout group? Is it okay if I present? My... Yeah, yeah. Javon, please. So from, it's for answering question three of what I understood. Okay. So. My understanding is he's like for so in the the PD the PDS speech mm -hmm. he he's like pretty basically giving us examples of like putting it putting us in his shoes basically on how he sees the unjust on like how unjust it is to be black in the United States mm -hmm. about how like hold on I just read something about like Uncle Sam having blood in his shoes mm -hmm. for and then like not and then. Hold on, excuse me. And just like giving us like some of these examples on how like it's unjust to black people, how they they, they live in the United States compared to other, I guess, the white race. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's two different realities, right? Um, the reality that Africans in America experience and then, um, you know, those who occupy white body experience. Absolutely. Um, did anyone get a chance to read and um, listen to the speech and be able to draw any distinctions between the, the two experiences? No one? All right, so what we'll do, um, we'll go into, we'll transition into my notes. Um, before we do that though, I have a quick video that I wanna show. Um, is dealing with the speech. I had to do a, um, in my visual methods class, I had to do a visual essay and I used this speech to kind of um, scaffold my essay. So I'll play that real quick, it's about eight minutes to provide some more context to some of the things that Malcolm is touching on in the speech and then we'll go into my notes. Um, are you all able to see the black screen? Yeah. All right. November 3rd, 1983, I began the process of understanding my place in the world. From the moment I opened my eyes, I began to collect and analyze data. Ontological understandings began to shape who I understood myself to be. Son, grandson, nephew, male, black, black, black. Black. Blackness in the Western context presents various particularities and nuanced constrictions. Blackness enables creative and dynamic possibilities to transcend.
these nuanced constrictions. Acts of rebellion, subversion, integration, political participation. Some acts have been more effective than others. The vote has always been positioned as the ideal way to address these nuanced constrictions placed on the black experience. How effective has electoral politics been in addressing these constrictions? Has it alleviated black pain and suffering, what Frank Wilderson called perpetual death? In 1870, the 15th Amendment outlawed voter discrimination, encouraging black male voter participation. Haram Rose Revelle became the first black man elected to the U.S. Senate. respond to this progress with Jim Crow laws and black codes, nullifying any notion of progress. Almost a century later, on August 6, 1965, the Voter Rights Act was passed, seeking to do what the 15th Amendment was meant to do, protect black men and women this time in their efforts to vote. This was widely celebrated as a great civil rights victory. Within five days of this victory, police brutality incited a five-day rebellion in Watts, California. The government has failed us. You can't deny that. Any time you live in the 20th century, 1964, and you walking around here singing, we shall overcome, the government has failed us. It's only a man on God. In 1993, the black community celebrated the first black president. He even appeared on the Arsenio Hall show to play saxophone. It's play in our lives, and until we become politically mature, we will always be misled, led astray, or deceived or maneuvered into uh, supporting someone politically who doesn't have the good of our community at heart. In 2009, the black community was actually able to celebrate the election of a real black president. Everyone was hopeful for the change, and the black community envisioned the beginning to the end of their pain and suffering. In February of 2012, the hope for change was shattered. 17-year-old Trayvon Martin was hunted and murdered. The Stand Your Ground law allowed for the acquittal of Trayvon's killer, birthing the Black Lives Matter movement. November 3rd, 2020. As I celebrated the day of my birth, I observed the world anxiously anticipate the removal of the Trump administration, which can be argued would be accomplished in large part due to the work of Stacey Abrams, Latasha Brown, and 91% of black women who turned out not only to flip the state of Georgia, but to be a major contributing factor in placing the Biden-Harris administration in the White House. When you see this, you can see that the Negro vote is the key factor. And despite the fact that you are in a position to, the, to be the determining factor, what do you get out of it? The Democrats have been in Washington, D.C. only because of the Negro More questions, but I tell you, if you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, then you ain't black. How will this administration address black pain and suffering more effectively than the 45 previous administrations? Will the black community continue to succumb to political theater? Only time can provide the answer, yet history provides great insight. While electoral politics has advanced the constrictions at a civil rights level, electoral politics has yet to produce any type of sanctuary for the systemic subjugation of the black body, failing to address the constrictions on a human rights level.
that. All right. Uh, so again, just to pro provide a little further context and insight um, into some of the themes that's articulated in the speech. Um, before I go into my notes, are there any questions that you guys want clarified around the speech, around Malcolm, or around anything before I jump into my notes? All right. So um, as you know, right, black nationalism is, is a central part of the speech. Um, he said he positions black nationalism not only as, as a political philosophy, but also as an economic philosophy, right? And I think another thing that becomes important when understanding this idea of black nationalism is Malcolm says, put your religions aside, right? Because if we bring our religions to the table, we're going to argue about that. So we're going to focus on what makes us the same. And in this context, it's our blackness. This thought for me is aligned with the black radical tradition. It's aligned with notions of Pan-Africanism, where Pan-Africanism seeks not to focus on what separates African people that make up the African diaspora. They're gonna focus on what brings us together, right? And I, and I think this notion of black nationalism is intended to do the same thing. Um, he also positions black nationalism as an educational, a re-education program, right? a re-education program to empower the black community. And a lot of this in his articulation will be done through an economic power base. Now, um, I believe it was Giovanni, and it may have been Damien, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure at this point, but one of them mentioned the role of the Nation of Islam as it pertains to I, Malcolm's ideations of black nationalism. And you're absolutely right, especially when it comes to the economic empowerment, right? Because at this time that Malcolm gave this speech, he's no longer a member of the Nation of Islam. He's branched away from there. But he's not that far removed to where he does not remember the success that the Nation of Islam had. The Nation of Islam starts off, its bases are in Chicago, more specifically the south side of Chicago. And in the south side of Chicago, um, the majority of the stores that are really all the stores that are black owned, I would say for the most part, are ran by the Nation of Islam. Cleaners, restaurants, um, pharmacies, little mom and pop shops, everything that the community needed, the black, sorry, excuse me, the Nation of Islam afforded that community. So when Malcolm is talking about this economic power base, it's not hyperbole. It's not wishful thinking. This is informed by the experience that he had while he was a member of the Nation of Islam and, he's, and his ability to see um, the amount of money that is able to be garnished and accumulated within the Black community if this idea of Black nationalism could come to fore, right? Um, also, the speech is littered with um, notions of self-help, agency, um, international questions of liberation, and this notion of anti-colonial liberation struggles. So Malcolm is beginning to place, um, expand his focus, not just on the plight of Africans in America, but looking brought more broadly and more glo globally to Africans everywhere, right? And how can their conditions be changed? Um, and with his anti-colonial critique, because of his international outlook, he's able to position America as a colony. Right. And, and he says that Africans within America are colonized because he says you cannot have this thing as a second class citizen. There's, there's, there's no such thing. You're either a citizen or you're a slave. Right. Second class citizenship equals colonization. So because of his um, attentiveness to the colonial situation abroad, to Africans exploitation abroad through colonialism, he's able to make the parallel of the colonial empire here in America. Um, I'll, I'll work my way back to that. He also questions the political maturity of African people, right? And, and that's also picked up in, in, the, in the brief video that we watched. Um, and, and the reason he questions this um, political maturity is something that I still think that we fall victim to as black folks in this country, right? Um, we have a tendency in this case to vote democratic without being able to hold the Democrats accountable for the promises that they make to garner our vote, right? And he says the same thing was happening in 1964 when he gave the speech, right? If you'll be dumb enough to put somebody in office that 
will not come through with the promises that they told you that they would. Not only are you a fool, but you are a traitor to your race, he says, right? And it's funny because I'm hearing conversations now, um, now that Biden's been in the office for a year, and it's, well, what is Biden doing for the black community? Um, I've seen Martin Luther King's daughter, Martin Luther King Jr.'s daughter, come out and talk about how she feels the Biden-Harris administration is, fa is failing the black community. Nobody's even seen Kamala Harris ass. She's just been ghost since she's got elected, right? So this is still, this, no, this notion of political immaturity is something I think is still plaguing um, the black community. Um, he makes the claim that the Democrat and the Republicans are two sides to the same coin, right? They work hand in hand to uphold these notions of white inferiority and to keep African people segregated. Um, and then he tells them, as he's articulating this idea that the Democrats and the Republicans are working hand in hand. I know you don't wanna hear this, but I'm gonna tell you the truth whether you like it or not. And I think this is a very core fundamental principle of Malcolm X, this idea and this notion of truth. This idea and this notion of truth drove Malcolm outside of the nation of Islam. Right. Once he heard that the things that the nation and in particular Elijah Muhammad, who was the leader of the nation, once he heard the things that they said that they were about, they were not actually being about. He would not allow that contradiction to settle in his soul. So he had to part ways. Right. When he seen that, um, when he make his pilgrimage to Mecca and he seen that people with blonde hair and blue eye and pale skin were able to make the um, the, the make their hajj, right? And he was able to break bread and eat with them and drink out the same cups that they were making, uh, that they were drinking out of. He knew that the way that the nation of Islam taught Islam was inaccurate, right? Because the nation of Islam said no one with blonde hair, blue eyes, or pale skin would be able to make it into to Mecca or to make it to paradise, right? But when he went to Mecca, he seen that was not the case. So he had to stand on this notion of truth. Right. So truth is a fund foundational pillar for Malcolm X. Um, he's also, again, more focused on collective notions of freedom. So not just looking at how can we get Africans in America free? Uh, how can we get the Africans in New York free? But how can we get African people globally free? And I, I believe this is largely informed by his travels. Right. He spent time with Kwame Nkrumah, who has the same type of mentality of thinking, how can we liberate all of the African people, not just the people who I am close to, right? And um, there's also this apocalyptic prophecy that undergirds the speech. What, does, what do I mean when I say an apocalyptic prophecy? What is the apocalyptic prophecy? What does that mean? What do you think the apocalyptic prophecy entails? What is the apocalypse? Is it a prophecy like of the end of it all? Yep, exactly. So I want you guys, I, I, and I know it was a little while ago, but I want you to think back two weeks and I want you to think back to um, James Baldwin and think back to the title of that James Baldwin um, piece that we read, The Fire Next Time. And think about how he ends that book and he, in the use of Noah, right? Um, God gave Noah the rainbow sign, no more water, the fire next time, right? So Baldwin also is dealing with this apocalyptic prophecy. And Baldwin says, if you know white folks aren't able to come to terms with these ideas and these notions of racism, then God will bring that fire next time. So Malcolm's kind of up to the same thing. Right. Malcolm is also offering a apocalyptic prophecy and the ultimatum that Malcolm is offering is you have the ballot. Right. You could allow African people to expre express their grievances through means that you deem justifiable. Right. The ballot or you have the bullet. Right. And if you don't, if you choose not to allow us to express our grievances via the ballot, then you're going to have to deal with this bullet. And you hear this in this notion of the racial powder keg, right? The racial powder keg is more dangerous than an atomic bomb, right? So 
Malcolm is predicting if, again, America does not atone for their racial discrepancies, then the end is near, right? The red hot summers of 1966 is what he's predicting, which will come true two years later. The rise of the Black Panthers, which he's predicting, which will come true a year later, right? So this is what I this is what I say when I mean by this notion of an apocalyptic prophecy. So remember, he starts off his speech by um, creating a bifurcation between religion and politics, right? He says if we bring our religion to the table, we'll argue and fight. So this is a political movement that's centered on black nationalism. At this time, Malcolm is also promoting his new political organization the Organization of Afro-American Unity, the OAAU, which is an offshoot or is inspired by the Organization of African Unity, which started in Africa by independent African leaders and independent African heads of state, right? So he's taking what he learned in his travel abroad and is trying to return home and implement that here in America. So the Organization for Afro-American Unity is the political mechanism that will address issues of racism. You also see an evolution in Malcolm X in the sense that once he returns from Mecca, he's willing to work with other civil rights leaders, right? He's, he's, he changes the way that he looks at this notion of integration, whereas before he was very much a pro, opposed to integration, right? Now he sees integration as a means to the same objective that he has, which is the freedom and liberation of African people. And I, and I think um, another thing that he does within separating religion and politics is he establishes Muslim Mosque Incorporated. So this is the spiritual vehicle that, that will address notions of religion, right? So he has the Muslim Mosque Incorporated to, ad to address religious and spiritual concerns, and then he has the organization of, organization of Afro-American unity to address political concerns. Because of his global ideas, because of his travels, right? Because of his ability to learn from African heads of state who liberated their countries from European and colonialism, He's starting to view this notion of Africans, um, African experiences here in America slightly differently. And what he seeks to do towards the end of his life is to take the United States uh, to the United Nations and charge them for crimes against humanity. And I don't know if you guys are paying attention, but recently someone else completed Malcolm's mission and took the United States to the United Nations for crimes against humanity. And they have been charged with five counts of crimes against humanity, I believe. But this is the work that Malcolm sought to do before he, he met his untimely demise. And what he seeks to do is move this notion of civil rights to a broader human rights issue, right? So there's a distinction between civil rights and there's a distinction between human rights. So let me ask you, not the movement, not the organization, but the, the claim, right? The claim, Black Lives Matter. What does that mean? What does the claim Black Lives Matter mean? Somebody tell me. What does Black Lives Matter mean? No one knows what Black Lives Matter means. It's literally in this, the term itself. So is it literal, like the lives, the lives of uh, Black people matter? Yeah, exactly, Giovanni, thank you, man. So if you have a movement, an organization built around this idea that Black Lives Matter, what does it say about the society that produced that organization or that movement. They are against the lives of black people? Exactly, Giovanni, thank you, man. So if you have an organization that is saying that black lives matter, that means we exist within a society that does not 
recognize, authenticate, or view Black Lives to Matter, right? So this, here's what I'm getting at. The distinction between human rights and the distinction between civil rights. So think back to the civil rights era. Think back to Martin Luther King in the 60s, right? What was the main thing that they were advocating for? What was their main thrust? What did they want most of all in the civil rights movement? Equality. Equality of what? Because you're right, but what type of equality? Equal rights. Equal rights. So how? So what does that look like? Integration, right? I want to be able to live where y'all live. I want to be able to go to school where y'all go to school. I want to be able to eat where y'all eat, right? These are all civic issues. They all determine your quality of life. Y'all feel follow where I'm going with this, right? So the civil rights movement was about improving the material conditions of black folks, right? About establishing equality in the lifestyle of black folks. Y'all with me? Black Lives Matter is about just the ability to live. Do you see the distinction between human rights, Black Lives Matter, and civil rights? We want integration. We want better schools. We want better jobs. We want better housing. Do you understand that distinction between civil rights and human rights? Y'all with me on that? Give me a yes or a no. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So now I ask you this question. With the understanding that I just provided, right? Black Lives Matter and terminology is a human rights issue. In my estimation, can, Tim, can correct me if I'm wrong, they approach issues still at a civil rights level. A lot of the things that you see done in the civil rights movement are still being done by groups like Black Lives Matter, right? And I only point them out because they're the most recent group and within the language, they're talking about human rights. But although they're talking about human rights, they organize themselves, they mobilize themselves, and they move as if they're advocating for civil rights. Do you see where I'm going with this? You see the distinction I'm drawing? So let me ask you, what are ways that groups like Black Lives Matter could begin to advocate for the human rights of African people, not just the civil rights of African people? What do you think? Can you repeat the question for me, please? Yeah. So if Black Lives Matter in terminology and language are advocate or are, are trying to bring up human rights issues, right? How can they organize, mobilize, and move to address human rights issues? Does that make more sense, Damon? Yeah. Okay. So what are some ideas that you guys have that would allow groups like Black Lives Matter to position human rights at the forefront juxtaposed to civil rights? What, can it be like the protests? That... It can, but I think it would determine what you're protesting and what you're asking for in the protest, right? All right. So what could you ask for if you're protesting that would call forth human rights just opposed to civil rights? What could be a demand? Like sure. So would a demand be like the stopping, like we demand to stop the killing of unarmed black people by police? Period. Absolutely, right? That's a human rights demand. Because I'm not saying that I want the way that I'm able to live my life to improve, that's dealing with civil rights, right? I'm saying, I just don't, I just wanna be able to live. I just want the ability to have a human experience and live my life, right? So to say, I just want y'all to stop killing me, that's a human rights issue. 
And to me, this is where the movements for black folks, period, across the board should be at. It should be advocating for human rights issues, no longer trying to advocate for civil rights issues. So I'll, I'll put this on pause here and we'll jump into our fishbowl. Um, I said last week where we, everyone's at with the fishbowl, so you should know whether or not you have um, two. If you have two, you're done. If you have one, you have one more to go. And if you haven't done any yet, you should probably start hopping on that soon. Um, is anyone want to volunteer to fishbowl? You could talk about the video. You could talk about my notes. You could talk about your breakout rooms or your journal. Any volunteer? I'll call that random. Um, let me know if you went twice already and uh, you're good to go. Sean, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Yeah, I've gone twice already. You want to pass already? All right, bet. Yeah. Um, Bridget, are you prepared to fishbowl today? I have gone twice already, too. Thank you. Um, Zachary, have you gone twice already? Zachary or Ibarra, have you gone twice? Um, Heather, have you gone twice? No, I have not. Are you prepared to fishbowl today? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Heather. Uh, Amir, have you gone twice already? Yeah, I have. Okay, cool. Um, Ariel, have you gone twice already? I have not. Okay. Are you prepared to fishbowl today? Yeah. Okay. And we'll see if we get one more and we'll be good to go. Go last. I'm sorry? Can I go last? Yeah. yeah, okay, perfect. So that'll close us out. So we have um, Heather, Ariel, and Damon for today's fishbowl. Whoever wants to start us off, it's on you. Um, I can go first. Okay. So um, things that I thought were very interesting in the reading, um, when uh, he emphasized and used the phrase uh, repetitively, he said, at the hands of the white man. And he clarified that it doesn't mean that they're anti-white, it's just anti the oppression that is at the hands of these people. And um, what else? It was a very loaded reading. And I think um, especially a lot of things we talk about when you shift it from more civil rights to human rights, it gets a lot heavier. And I think that's also part of the importance of switching it to that. Um, and I also thought it was very interesting how he talked about the politics in the US as basically just a government conspiracy and um, just the 310 years that uh, black people worked in this country without a dime in return and the conspiracy to just for some reason keep that dime away from them and not give it to them and almost refuse to see like they made our country and way too ingrained in the fabrics of our political environment is racism and the oppression that we just still continue every single day for some reason. Yeah. Thank you, Heather. I'm going to circle back to how you started off this speech. Um, I'm sorry, how you started off your fishbowl, because I think it's a very good point. Um, who's, who's next, Ariel or Damon? I could go. Um, I thought it was interesting also, like in the, I said, like, um, the switch from just like Black Lives, like, matter into like um human rights i thought it was really interesting how he does that because like he changes just like from them just being discriminated to their like actually putting their lives in danger and i think like, it's it's a more important factor because people just saw like oh they just want to be able to vote be able to be part of the community but in reality they were being attacked and he's like being a point that us being safe is more important than just getting our right to vote or being just equals yeah because yeah, i mean what good is a vote if you aren't able to live. So that's, that's yeah. a good point, Ariel. Thank you. Yeah. Um, something that I took from this and that uh, from my perspective was um just the way he he was um like the the type of energy he had to put up with the problems they were going through and the patience and like he he was out of patience actually yeah. and he he had um, the energy to try to uplift the black community as a whole. And he tried to put them on their back and try to do as much as he could. And um, 
I really like um, whenever I read like books or like history about him, how like he's compared and stuff to Martin Luther King and stuff. Um, and I like, I already said about the Islam, state of Islam. I feel like that's, um, that's something that I always, when I think of Islam, I always think of uh, Malcolm X. That's like something that always pops up. That's what I took from this. Yeah. Um, so what I'll do is I'm, I'm gonna work with Damien and then work my way back to, to, to Heather. Um, you know, that lack of patience is very important. And, and I think um, that also caused him to split from the nation of Islam because um, what was happening, so for example, there was a church bombing, and I want to say Alabama, I believe it was, where four young girls got murdered in the bombing. And like this incensed Malcolm. And he wanted to take a faction of the Nation of Islam down to uh, that area and handle some business, right? And one thing about the Nation of Islam, they have what's called the Fruit of Islam, the FOI. The Fruit of Islam are the men in the nation. And the fruit of Islam are also like the military faction of the nation. They do a lot of the bodyguards and bodyguarding and, and things of that nature. Um, Malcolm, by and large, trained these fruit of Islam, right? So in Malcolm's estimation, it's like, yo, if we are training these people to defend black folks, why aren't we using them when black folks are getting terrorized? And Elijah Muhammad, who was the leader of the nation at the time, would always put Malcolm on the back burner and, and tell him to chill, right? And this caused Malcolm to have somewhat of a, um, not a disdain, if you will, but a disillusionment with, with Elijah Muhammad. Um, there's other um, examples, you know, things like the March on Washington, where he wanted to involve himself at some capacity, but the Nation of Islam handicapped his ability to get involved. Um, and, and, I, and I think Ariel brings up a really good point in the sense that, you know, what's the, what's the use of civil rights issues advocating for things like voting, um, integration, um, school, and school and housing equalities, if you don't have the ability to live life, right? And I think what happens is, especially when you look at the civil rights movement, if you read it closely, if you read the civil rights movement, you study it closely, they view things like voting as a means to achieve freedom, right? And what got happened is somehow the message gets ossified, um, it gets lost in translation, and the focus doesn't become about freedom, but just about voting itself, right? And you can see once we gain that vote, the power structure was two steps ahead and they made it to where that vote does not even matter anymore, right? And this is where Malcolm is kind of, he's picking up on this and he's saying like, yo, this is where the political immaturity is coming in and it's killing us. Because as he says, America is so evenly divided, wherever the black vote bl votes will determine who's going to what he says, the White House and who's going to the doghouse, right? So he sees the power that African people have from a political standpoint, but the lack of political education does not allow for African people to actualize or realize that power, right? And then Heather brings up a good point in the sense of, you know, he, he says at the hands of the white man, right? But then he provides a subtle nuance to that, because this, this is what I call New Testament Malcolm, right? This is not not Old Testament Malcolm to where all white folks are devils, there's no other explanation, that's just it. But he, he provides this nuance and says, and it's not about the white man, it's about what's being done to us, right? We wanna stop what's being done to us. And that's the distinction that Malcolm draws, right? And, and I think that shows his growth his maturity, and his standing on this pillar of truth, right? Because if you think about what I said earlier, right, Nation of Islam taught that no white man can make it to what the Islamics call paradise. No white man can make his hajj, right? He can make his pilgrimage back to Mecca. But when Malcolm made his hajj, when Malcolm made his pilgrimage, he seen white folks there. Right? So he knew that that could not be true because his own eyes told him otherwise. So he had to stand on the truth. 
that he found. I want to end with this. I want to ask you guys a question. When you hear this idea of nationalism, typically that provokes imagery that are that is negative, right? Um, it has a negative connotation. Um, when I hear nationalism, I think about like the tiki torch cats. We will not, you will not replace us, right? When I hear nationalism, I think about um, January sixth um, when they stormed the Capitol, right? This this is kind of the images that come into my mind when I hear ideas or notions around nationalism. For y'all, when you heard Malcolm talk about black nationalism. What did that stir up in you? What images did that provoke? What um, ideas came to mind when you heard of black nationalism? Did this terminology have a negative connotation for you? Is what I'm asking. Myra Lee, when you read the speech or when you heard the speech and you heard Malcolm talk about nationalism, black nationalism. Um, did you perceive that to be something negative or positive when you first heard it? No, I didn't see it as a negative thing. I so think did, when I think of like um, white nationalism, I think of violence and the oppression of other groups of people. But in terms of like black nationalism, I kind of, you ask about the imagery that it provides. Yeah, I just what it made you think, yeah. Yeah, it's more of like kind of black people being more in no, so strong of like independence and freedom from what we would call white nationalism. Yeah. So let me ask it this way then. Did anyone um have a negative initial or original interpretation or understanding of black nationalism? Did that provoke any negative thoughts for anyone? Okay, dope. Because um, typically, when I when I have this lecture, I have to kind of iron out the fact that black nationalism does not perform and equate to the way same ways that white nationalism does. So I think you guys are a little bit ahead of the game in that regard. Okay, so let's talk about um, what we'll be doing for next week. One second, let me get that pulled up. So there's no reading for next week. It's just a video. Um, we're still dealing with um, oration. So instead of Malcolm X this week, next week will be Martin Luther King. 43 minute video, I've been to the mountaintop. It's on YouTube, I've been to the mountaintop. So please watch that. That will be our discussion for next week. Um, I do also ask if you have not seen um, the Malcolm X video from this week, watch it because a large of our a large part of our conversation for next week will be comparing Malcolm X's style of speech to Martin Luther King's style of speech so it's going to be fundamental that you know um, both styles so please if you have not watched the Malcolm X speech watch that and, and do think of in juxtaposition to what Martin Luther King is talking about um, are there any 